Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. When the doorbell rang, they had just finished dinner. Bori, the 12-year-old, jumped up to answer the door before either her father or brother could rise, but she quickly returned to the dining room with a quizzical look on her face. It's a policeman, Daddy. He wants to talk to you, she reported. A jolt of fear shot through Frank, but he tried to hide it from his children. When he went to the door, he saw the caller was actually a Georgia State Trooper. Are you Frank Parker? The trooper asked. Yes, Frank confirmed. Are you the husband of Meredith Parker? When Frank nodded, the trooper looked at the two children and said, May I speak with you in private, Mr. Parker? Frank felt his throat constrict, and he had to clear it before he could speak. Bobby, Lori, please go to your rooms. I need to speak with the officer alone. Both kids began to protest, but when their father barked, now, at them, they jumped and hurried to obey. They weren't used to hearing the tone of voice. Once the children had left the room, the officer turned back to their father. Mr. Parker, I've been asked to give you some bad news. Your wife's airplane is missing and presumed down. It dropped off the radar tonight approximately halfway between Miami International Airport and Nassau. A Coast Guard ship is in the area now, looking for survivors. The facts were straightforward enough. In her role as regional sales VP for a major multinational corporation, Meredith had set out to visit their Caribbean headquarters in the Bahamas, accompanied by the region's chief financial officer. She was an experienced small plane pilot, so the 180-mile flight to Nassau should have been routine. As a result, Frank had thought nothing of it when Meredith had called to let him know her plans. Now, he was distraught. This had to be his worst nightmare. His wife's plane had crashed at night in the shark-infested waters of the Caribbean Sea. The officer provided a few additional details that did nothing to give Frank any encouragement before he left, promising that the Coast Guard would call with updates in the morning or earlier if there was any news. No sooner had the door closed behind the trooper than both Bobby and Lori came running to his side, anxiety written on their faces, asking questions that their father couldn't answer. Frank knew they had been listening. He would have eavesdropped too if he'd been in their shoes. The three of them clung to each other each trying to find encouraging things to say to the others. Lori began to cry and although he was trying to be brave, Bobby's eyes were red as well. Frank did his best to keep it together for his children's sakes, but inside he was frantic. There was no thought of cleaning the dishes or doing homework. Their anguish kept the three of them within arm's length of each other for the rest of the evening. It grew past the children's normal bedtime, but still no phone call came. Finally, exhausted by the lateness of the hour and their fears, all three gravitated to the master bedroom, and the children slept with their dad for the first time since they'd been little and afraid of thunderstorms. They were up and trying to eat breakfast the next morning when a representative from the Coast Guard called. The slim hope stirred by the call was quickly dashed when the officer told Frank that the cutter searching the area had found nothing. Frank called the principal at the middle school the kids attended to let her know why Bobby and Lori would be absent that day. Then he went to check on the two of them, only to find them in front of the television watching a report on the missing plane on CNN. Frank wasn't sure whether to let them keep watching or turn the set off, but before he could reach a decision, the phone began to ring again, and from that point on, whenever Frank would hang up from one call, another would come in. Not surprisingly, the first calls were from Meredith's parents and his own. All were frantic with worry while still trying to project a false optimism that she would miraculously be found. Frank promised to call back immediately with any news. Next came the calls from their friends and colleagues of Meredith. All wanted to say or do something to help, but none of them had any idea how to do so. The conversations were short and awkward. Most difficult of all were the calls from the media. He should have expected those, but Frank was caught off guard when the first reporter phoned, and he talked to the reporter from the Journal Constitution much longer than he wanted. Then representatives from other media began calling, and when Frank realized what was happening, he began screening all the calls and returning only those from people about whom he cared. Sometime during all this activity, the procession of neighbors and friends began, each set coming to their door with condolences and with food. At first their generosity was appreciated because Frank had no energy for preparing meals, but soon he and his children had more food than they could hope to eat in a week. It was an old southern tradition to express concern and condolences with food, but while Frank appreciated the gesture, Every roast and casserole was a bitter reminder that his wife of 20 years was almost certainly dead. The next few days were horrible. The Parkers were virtual prisoners in their own home, kept there by their desire not to have to deal with other people and by their hope for some news from the Coast Guard. Frank made daily calls to the office in Miami for updates, 
but the reports were always negative. Then, five days after the state trooper had arrived on their doorstep, came the news they'd been dreading. A Coast Guard officer called to tell Frank that wreckage from his wife's plane had been found. There were no signs of any survivors. I'm sorry, sir, the officer concluded, but we're going to have to see search and rescue operations at this time. Frank wanted nothing more than to hide away and mourn in solitude. But that option was not available. Instead, he faced a seemingly endless list of responsibilities, all painful. The worst, of course, was having to tell Bobby and Lori the sad news and trying to console them. When they had finally calmed down, he had to phone relatives and close friends to let them know. Next was a call to their church to arrange for a memorial service, followed by one to the newspaper to submit an obituary. Then came more calls to share the time and date of the service. By the time he was done, Frank felt physically and emotionally exhausted. Somehow the family made it through the service and began the slow, painful process of trying to resume a normal life. The following week the kids returned to school, and the resumption of their routine seemed to help a little. Frank was not so fortunate. Now a whole new set of duties fell on his shoulders. At the urging of a friend, Frank contacted an attorney to find out what his legal responsibilities were. He was shocked to learn that he would have to petition for a death certificate. But her plane crashed at sea, he protested. How can there be any doubt? I know, the attorney commiserated, but in the absence of a body and a physician's certificate, the court must make a formal declaration. Am I going to have to wait seven years? Frank asked in distress. No, the attorney assured him. In a case like this where an individual has been lost at sea, there's usually no significant delay. You may have to answer some questions, but typically such cases are resolved very quickly. I can get the petition started for you, the attorney went on. I can also help you get all your other documents changed. When Frank looked confused, the attorney said, you know, like any joint bank accounts, your mortgage, your insurance, car titles, your will, anything like that. While I do that, you need to contact your wife's company to see about any benefits to which you may be entitled, as well as to claim any personal belongings. Frank shook his head in weariness. In his grief, he hadn't never stopped to think just how complicated it would be to untangle the life he and his wife had shared. Now he faced another chore that he dreaded, calling on the widow of John Collier, the financial executive who had been on the plane with Meredith. Frank had met Collier only a couple of times at his wife's company functions, but he had taken an immediate dislike to the executive. In Frank's eyes, Collier was one of those egotistical types who thought he was smarter than everyone else. In the brief time Frank had spent with the man, Collier managed to drop enough names and boast about his accomplishments enough to leave a bad taste in Frank's mouth. But that wasn't his widow's fault, Frank reminded himself, and he felt he had a duty to call on her. Frank had phoned ahead, so Amanda Collier was expecting him. As the two exchanged condolences, Frank realized that she was probably the only one who truly knew how he was feeling. When they'd been seated in her living room, she asked kindly, So how are you doing now, Frank? It's hard, Amanda, it's really hard. I just can't accept that she's really gone. So many things keep reminding me of her. He shook his head helplessly. You know what's the hardest thing? When I'm out on the street or in a crowd of people, I keep thinking that I've spotted her. The other day, I must have scared some poor woman half to death when I chased her down because I thought she was Meredith. He looked at the floor, recalling the memory and his emotions when he had realized what he was doing. Amanda watched him with sympathetic eyes. She knew there weren't any words to help. Finally, he looked up at her. And how about you, Amanda? How are you doing? It's not easy, Frank, but I'm going to make it, she told him. The truth is I'm probably doing much better than you. John and I didn't have any children, so I don't have two to console the way you do. Also, and I wouldn't tell this to anyone else, John and I weren't getting along very well before all this happened. I'd caught him having a couple of flings in the past, and I think he was in the middle of another affair. If this hadn't happened, we'd probably be headed for divorce before too long. I'm so sorry to hear that, Amanda, Frank told her sympathetically. I can only imagine the conflicting emotions you must be feeling. Yes, she agreed. One moment I'm relieved that I don't have to deal with his cheating anymore and the next I'm filled with guilt because I don't feel sadder. And despite everything, there's a part of me that still misses him. Are you going to be okay financially? Frank asked, trying to change the subject. I'm not sure, she admitted. The good news is that the company provided life insurance on Frank, and because he died while on business, with the double indemnity clause, I'll receive twice the face value. 
The bad news is I'm going to need every penny of that money because I've learned Frank had made a series of bad investments in the futures market and severely depleted our net worth. What Amanda had said about her late husband did not surprise Frank. It took no stretch of the imagination for him to believe that an egotist like John Collier would not prove a faithful husband. For that matter, the idea that Collier would fancy himself a wheeler dealer in the market was entirely in keeping with Frank's mental picture of the man. What did grab Frank's attention was Amanda's mention of the company paid life insurance. He remembered his attorney's advice and made a mental note to contact the benefits department of Meredith's company right away. If Collier had been covered, surely Meredith would have had a similar policy, and until he could find a job, those funds might come in very handy. After chatting a few minutes longer, Frank arose from the couch. Amanda, please forgive me, but I'm going to have to cut my visit short. Billy and Lori will be getting out of school soon, and I've got to go pick the two of them up. But please stay in touch, and if there's anything I can do to help, even if you just need a sympathetic ear to bend, please don't hesitate to call me. When Frank drove up to their home after picking up Bobby and Lori, he was surprised to see a car parked out front. Frank got his children into the house through the garage, and a minute later, the doorbell rang. Outside were a man who looked to be in his fifties and a younger woman, both dressed in business attire. I'm Special Agent Harold Barnes. The man introduced himself, and this is Special Agent Celia Murray. We're with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. We'd like to come in and ask you a few questions in conjunction with your wife's disappearance. When she realized the two were law enforcement officers, Lori wrapped her arms around her father's waist and buried her face in his side. Frank could feel her tears dampening his shirt, and he held her tightly. What's this about? He demanded angrily. Before the first agent could speak, Agent Murray interceded. I'm so sorry we've upset your daughter, Mr. Parker. All we're trying to do is complete a routine check in connection with your petition for a death certificate for Mrs. Parker. If you'd like us to come back later, We'll try to do so at a time that would be better for you. Frank ignored her and turned to face his daughter. It's all right, honey. Nothing bad has happened. The female agent abruptly bent down on one knee, reached into her purse, pulled out a tissue, and handed to the girl. Here, honey, she said in a gentle voice. Lori hesitated and then shyly accepted the tissue, wiping her eyes and then blowing her nose. When Frank saw that his daughter had calmed down, he put his arm around her and spoke to her. These people need to talk with me a while about your mom, Lori. Why don't you go get started on your homework? I'll be right out here in the living room if you need me. With that, he gently pushed the 12-year-old toward her room. Then he turned to face the officers. If it won't take too long, let's go ahead and try to get this over with. The three of them stepped into the living room and seated themselves around a coffee table. We just need to get a little background information on your wife, Mr. Parker, the male agent began. How long were the two of you married? We got married in 1990, right after we both graduated from the University of Georgia, Frank replied, thinking back to the beautiful brunette co-ed he had wooed and won so many years ago. And she was employed by International Marketing Corporation up until, well, until her disappearance? That's right, Frank confirmed. She was sales vice president for the southeastern U.S. If her region was the southeast, why would she have been traveling to the Bahamas? The younger woman asked. At IMC, Frank explained, the Southeast included Puerto Rico and the Caribbean as well as the U.S. Their Caribbean headquarters are in Nassau, so it wasn't uncommon for Mary to fly down there. Mary? The woman asked. Frank felt his voice grow husky. Mary was my pet name for her. Agent Murray reached across and patted his hand sympathetically. That's all right, Mr. Parker. I know this is hard for you. The older agent decided to change the line of questioning. Was it normal for your wife to fly her own plane on business trips? Yes, Frank replied. Mary's dad was a pilot and she got her license as soon as she was old enough. She took every opportunity to fly herself because she said it made her independent of commercial airline schedules. She used to say she could get where she needed to be, complete her business, and be back home while the competition was still stuck in the terminal. She felt like it gave her an edge, especially when she was starting out. The two agents made notes. Then Agent Murray looked up at him. And what about you, Mr. Parker? What do you do? Frank managed to smile. I'm a house husband. Seeing their looks, he went on. I was an aerospace engineer up until three years ago, when my company cut back and I was laid off. The only prospects I could find for a new job would have required me to relocate out of state. But in the meantime, Mary's job was going great. She'd gotten a couple of major promotions and was earning a great salary plus big bonuses. It didn't make sense for her to quit. 
So we agreed that I'd manage the household and take care of the kids while she worked. And how did this change affect your relationship with Mrs. Parker? Agent Barnes asked. Why is that relevant? Frank asked irritatedly. Please bear with us, Mr. Parker, the younger woman interceded. We're required to check to see if there could be any factors that might have played a role in your wife's disappearance. It's all routine. Somewhat mollified, Frank looked at the two of them. Of course it was a big change for me, but I'm an engineer. I'm trained to measure and assess all the factors in a design. It was easy to see that my changing roles was the right thing for our family at that time. I made it possible for Mary to devote herself to her career, and I made sure that Bobby and Lori always had a parent there for them at all times. Neither of the agents said anything, and Frank felt as though the question was still hanging in the air. I don't mean it was easy, he went on. She was always calling on customers or attending meetings at corporate, so I didn't see as much of her as I would have liked. Sometimes it felt like her job came first and he suddenly realized what he was saying and added swiftly, but that's pretty much par for the course in corporate life. Besides, it's worked out well, he caught himself, until now. Just two more questions, Mr. Parker, Agent Barnes said. Did you notice any changes in your wife's behavior in the time prior to her disappearance? Not really, Frank replied after a moment's thought. I know she was under a lot of pressure in the last year or so, and her travel schedule was heavier than ever. But Mary said she was in line for a major promotion. When she got it, she promised the new job would cut down on her travel as well as come with a high-level title and a big bump in her salary. Last question, Agent Barnes said, writing on his pad. Are you aware of any changes in your finances that your wife might have made in the last few months? No, Frank replied with certainty. I keep up with all our finances, and I haven't seen anything out of the ordinary. The young woman glanced at her partner. I think we've taken enough of your time, Mr. Parker. We should be able to wrap all this up pretty quickly and we'll let you know as soon as we've concluded. In the meantime, if you think of anything you feel we should know, please call me at this number. As she spoke, she handed him her card, and the two agents headed for the door. Frank headed back to his children's bedrooms to make sure they were getting their homework done. Both looked busy when he peeked in their rooms. They're strong kids, he thought. They've been through hell and they're holding up well, all things considered. The next day, Frank drove to IMC headquarters to pay a visit to the benefits department. The head of the department met him and, after expressing her condolences, handed over a box filled with Meredith's personal effects from her office. Frank had to swallow hard when he saw the framed family portrait she had kept on her desk. The director then turned him over to a specialist to advise him on Meredith's benefits. The first order of business was to look at Meredith's 401k account. Frank had regularly seen her annual statements, so he wasn't expecting any surprises. When he saw the final total, however, it was quite a bit higher than he had expected. Apparently, during the last year Meredith had upped her contributions to the plan, putting in more even than the company would match. She was really trying to provide for her family, the specialist commented with admiration. The specialist went on to advise Frank to withdraw the funds as soon as possible and roll them over into his own IRA, so that he could more easily manage the funds. The other surprise Frank got was the sheet he received outlining the life insurance benefit he would receive as Meredith's beneficiary. He learned that Meredith had opted for the maximum amount of insurance for which she was eligible. With the accidental death multiplier, Frank was amazed to realize that he would receive almost four years' worth of Meredith's income. The insurance company will pay that out in annual installments, the woman explained. Otherwise, the taxes would eat you alive. Payment of all of the benefits, of course was contingent on the company's receiving a copy of Meredith's death certificate. But, after the visit from the two GBI agents, Frank felt confident that would be forthcoming soon. Frank left the office building much relieved. He had thought he would have to begin an immediate search for another job. Now, he realized, he had a significant grace period to get his life together. Thank you, Mary, he whispered fervently. Frank was making dinner for the family late one afternoon several days later when the doorbell rang. When Frank went to answer, he found Special Agent Murray on his doorsteps again. After he'd asked her in, she explained the purpose of her visit. Mr. Parker, Frank, I wanted to let you know in person that our investigation has been completed and that your wife's death certificate has been issued. You should receive a copy from the court by certified mail in the next few days. Frank heaved a sigh of relief. He had believed there would be no problems, but it was a relief to know this important task had been accomplished. Just then, a panicked scream came from the back of the house and Frank was horrified to hear Lori's voice yelling, Help me, Daddy, help me. He turned and sprinted for Lori's room. 
Celia Murray was right on his heels, her hand reaching for the service revolver in the shoulder holster under her jacket. When Frank burst into Lori's room, he found his daughter staring at a large red blood stain on her jeans. I'm bleeding, Daddy, she wailed. Frank was terrified. What happened? Lori? Did you cut yourself? As he started for his daughter's side, a hand caught his elbow and pulled him back with surprising strength. Let me handle this, Celia said firmly and pushed him toward the door. But I? He protested, but the young woman would not be moved. I'll handle this, Frank. Just go out in the living room and wait. Something about the authority in her voice made him pause, and with the determined young woman blocking his way, he tentatively stepped back into the hallway. Celia calmly closed the door in his face. After fifteen anxious minutes, the door opened and Celia came out. Before Frank could ask a question, she grasped his arm. Lori is fine. You need to go to the store right now and buy a package of sanitary napkins. Get the smallest size they have. But Lori, Bobby, he began to protest. I'll take care of Lori and I'll let Bobby know what's happening. You just need to go to the store and get back here as fast as you can, she said. As Frank drove to a nearby convenience store, the realization hit him and he began to berate himself. She started having her menstrual period. You idiot. You should have realized that immediately. On the return trip, he continued to curse himself for never talking to his daughter about the maturation into womanhood. Oh, Mary, I need you more than ever, he thought in self-pity. When he got home, Celia met him at the front door and snatched the bag away from him. After looking at the package, she smiled. You did good, Dad. Then she disappeared back into Lori's room. After thirty more minutes, Celia reappeared with her arm around Lori, who hung back somewhat shyly. Frank fell to his knees and hugged his daughter when she came to him. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. I should have talked with you about that a long time ago. I just didn't think about it. It's okay, Daddy, the girl spoke up. I just didn't know what was happening, and I was scared. Celia explained it all to me. I know what to do now. As she spoke, she slipped her hand into Celia's, and Frank realized his daughter had made a new friend. He stood and turned to Celia. Thank you so much. It's a good thing you were here. I guess I panicked for a moment. He looked down at his daughter. I'm afraid I'm not so good with girls. Celia smiled, but before she could speak, Bobby popped around the corner. Just because my dumb little sister has her first period, does that mean we're not going to have any dinner tonight? I'm starving. Bobby. Lori shrieked, but Frank grabbed her before she could attack her big brother. Bobby, if you talk like that to your sister again, I guarantee you'll be going to bed hungry. Frank warned his son, but before his threat could sound too ominous, he went on, now, go wash your hands and set the table. Then he turned back to Celia. The least we can do is offer you a meal for all you've done. It isn't exactly gourmet cooking, but there's plenty to eat. The young woman was clearly embarrassed. Thank you, but I can't intrude. Her protestations were halted, however, when Lori tugged on her hand. Please, Celia, please stay and eat with us. Gazing at her new friend, Celia smiled and said, All right, Lori, just for you. Looking up at Frank, she smiled again. Thank you. I'd love to have dinner with your family. The four of them sat down to eat, and Celia found herself the target of numerous questions from the two children about her experiences in law enforcement. Frank ate and listened, both in amusement at his children's curiosity and in admiration at the easy way Celia handled their questions. He suddenly realized that this was the first time the two of them had really seemed to come out of the shell of their sorrow. When dessert was over, Frank shooed Bobby and Lori off to do their homework, then offered Celia a cup of coffee. As the two of them sat at the table, Frank got a chance to ask his own questions. You certainly seem to be comfortable with Bobby and Lori. Do you work a lot with young people? She smiled. Actually, I come from a big family, two brothers and three sisters. I was the oldest, so I guess I was second mom to the rest of them. She paused to take a sip of her coffee, then went on, that's why I knew what to do with Lori this afternoon. I got to walk each of my sisters through the trauma of puberty. She looked at Frank and smiled again. For what it's worth, my dad was just as helpless as you were today. Frank grinned sheepishly. Well, all I can say is I'm glad you happened to be here. Even when I finally realized what was going on, I still wouldn't have known how to get Lori calmed down so quickly. She smiled to acknowledge his thanks, then her expression grew more serious. How are they coping with the loss of their mother? She asked. Frank sighed. About as well as can be expected, I think. Lori has been very clingy. I think she's really missing the female influence. As for Bobby, it's hard to tell. He's been sullen and somewhat withdrawn, 
but I don't know whether that's the result of Mary's death or just the fact that he's a teenager now. Celia looked at him sympathetically. From what I've seen, I think you're doing a great job with them. It's just going to take time for them and for you. With that, she stood and said, I really enjoyed the meal, Frank, but I've intruded on your family far too long. I need to get going, but if it's all right, I'd like to say goodbye to Lori and Bobby. When Frank nodded, she walked down the hall, and Frank heard her say goodbye to Bobby. Then she spent a few minutes in Lori's room, and when she returned, Lori came with her, her arm around Celia's waist. She really has made a new friend, Frank thought in wonder. A couple of days later, a package arrived in the mail for Lori. When his excited daughter tore open the wrapping, she found a pink stuffed elephant, along with a note from Celia. Frank was gratified by the thoughtfulness but bemused by the selection. Lori's too old for stuffed animals, he thought, but he was surprised to see the toy given a prominent place on Lori's bed. I guess there's still some little girl left in her yet, he conceded. He called Celia's office the next day to thank her. I would never have thought of that, he admitted, but somehow it was just the right thing for Lori. Celia was delighted that his daughter was pleased with her gift and made Frank promise to keep in touch and let her know how Lori and Bobby were doing. A couple of weeks later, Frank was paying bills one morning when he got a call from Bobby's homeroom teacher. I'd like to meet with you to talk about your son, the teacher told Frank. He's having some discipline problems in school. Frank agreed to meet with her the next day, but he decided not to say anything to Bobby that night. He wanted to wait until he learned what was happening before confronting his son. The meeting was set for the following day after classes, while the kids were at phys ed. Mrs. Soldana, the homeroom teacher, told the concerned father that Bobby's behavior in class had grown worse over the last few months. I didn't want to say anything at first because I know he's been through so much, the teacher explained, but it seems to be getting worse. He's become increasingly disengaged from his classes, he's not doing his homework, and his other teachers tell me he's not paying attention in their classes. He's always done so well up to now, but his grades are really going to plummet this semester if he doesn't do something to turn things around. Frank was troubled. How much do you think being a teenager has to do with this, Mrs. Soldena? There's no question that's a tough age for kids, especially boys, she told him, but we're used to that. I think his mother's death is affecting him more than he may have let on to you. You may want to consider getting counseling for him. Frank thanked the woman and returned to his car to wait uneasily for his kids to finish their gym classes. He was upset to learn about the problems Bobby was having and was determined to have a long talk with the boy. When Frank got Bobby and Lori home, he sent Lori to her room to get started on her homework, then led Bobby into the master bedroom. The boy's face darkened. He knew he was in trouble. Frank recounted his visit with Bobby's homeroom teacher and cited some of the examples she had given him. What's going on, Bobby? Why are you acting this way? Frank demanded. No reason, the boy replied sullenly. Come on, you're smarter than that. His father shot back. Don't you care about your grades? Not really, Bobby mumbled. Frank was frustrated by his son's unresponsiveness, and in anger he tried to shame his son into a reaction. What would your mother think if she knew you were screwing up? Who cares? Bobby shouted back angrily. She was such a witch. In shock and anger, Frank grabbed his son and yelled at him, Don't you ever speak of your mother that way. How can you say such a thing? In fear at his father's rage and pain at his strong grip, the boy blurted out, I saw her. I saw her screwing that man. As soon as the words came out of his mouth, he slumped to the bed and began to sob. In astonishment, Frank sat down on the bed beside his son, put his arm around him, and held him as though he were a small child. It's all right, he kept repeating, trying to calm the boy's obvious anguish. When Bobby's crying had subsided, Frank lifted his son's head. It's all right, Bobby. I'm not mad at you. Just tell me what you saw. His son looked at him tearfully. It was last fall. You let me ride my bike to school one day, but I forgot my math homework, so I sneaked out at lunch to come home and get it. While I was looking for it in my room, I heard mom come in. I didn't want her to catch me, so I hid. That's when I heard the man's voice. What man? Frank asked, a little too quickly. I don't know, Bobby said, some guy. I never saw him before. That's okay, Frank soothed him. Just tell me what happened next. They came in here, and then it got quiet, so I thought I could sneak out. But then I heard mom make a funny sound, and I was scared, and I looked in, and they were on the bed, and they were screwing. The words poured out of his mouth faster and faster as though he was desperate to spit them out, and when he finished, he began to cry again. Why did she do that, dad? How could mom act like such a witch? As Frank listened to his son's story, he felt himself go numb. But he had no time to deal with his own emotions, his son needed him. 
I understand, Bobby. It's okay. I'm sorry you had to see that, but I'm glad you told me. He took his son gently by the shoulders and turned him around to face him. Sometimes people we love make mistakes or do something we don't like. That doesn't mean we don't love them anymore. It just means we don't like what they did. I don't know why your mother would do that, son, but I know she loved you and Lori very much. It's the good things she did that I want you to remember about her. He held his son and continued to talk to him for a while longer. When he felt that the boy had calmed down sufficiently, he gently urged him to start on his homework while Frank went off to the kitchen to get dinner started. Before Bobby left, Frank enjoined him to say nothing to Lori. The boy promised, and Frank felt fairly comfortable that he would keep the disturbing news from his sister. The rest of the evening passed without further incident, but once the kids were in bed, Frank's emotions began to erupt. His first reaction was to deny what Bobby had told him. His son had to be mistaken or to have misinterpreted what he saw. But he couldn't maintain that rationalization very long. His son had been too upset by the experience. And, Frank had to admit ruefully, a teenager these days would certainly recognize sex when he saw it. With that admission, Frank's thoughts turned bitter. How could Mary have betrayed him? He had thought they had a good marriage. How could she have been screwing someone on the side? For that matter, who was the other man? And how long had the affair lasted? It's hard enough to lose your wife in a plane crash, he thought in despair. It's worse to learn you lost her long before that. Sleep was slow in coming that night, and the next day Frank was in a black mood. It was Tuesday, a day he would normally go to the gym, and after the kids were off to school, he decided to keep his routine. For a while the exercise helped divert his attention, but when he hit the treadmill his mind returned to his wife's infidelity. How could Mary have done that? And in our own bed? He asked. Somehow the location made the betrayal even worse. For that matter, how could she know I wouldn't be home? But the answer hit him immediately. It must have been one of the days when I went to the gym. I'm such a creature of habit. She would have been pretty certain the house would be empty. But the answer to that question immediately raised others. If she planned her little assignation to fit my schedule, that doesn't sound like it was a spur-of-the-moment thing. How often did she meet him there? It couldn't have been every week. Her travel schedule would have interfered. Every question seemed to raise another, each only added to his anguish. He did his best to act normally around Bobby and Lori, but over the next few days, he continued to suffer. He found himself making a trip to the drugstore to buy antacids. He'd never had stomach problems before. Compounding his misery was the lack of anyone to talk to about his discovery. He certainly didn't want to involve his parents or Meredith's. He knew the news would be devastating to them. Likewise, he didn't want to talk to his friends and risk becoming the subject of gossip in the neighborhood. And, he thought, I certainly don't want to risk having any of schoolmates teasing Bobby or Lori. He felt trapped. He was working at his desk one evening when he noticed Celia Murray's card. She told me to call her if I had any additional information, he remembered. But in truth, he was desperate for any excuse to share his news with someone and get another perspective. He called the cell phone number she had handwritten on the card, and when he identified himself, Celia seemed pleased to hear from him. But her tone changed to one of concern when he told her he needed to talk with her. Are Lori and Bobby okay? She asked anxiously. They are, but I'm not, he replied. Could you possibly have lunch with me tomorrow? This isn't the kind of thing I want to discuss over the phone. She quickly agreed and suggested a place near the GBI offices where she worked. It's a quiet little place. We should be able to talk, she assured him. When he hung up, Frank found himself feeling a bit better at the prospect of unburdening himself. Celia was waiting in the restaurant when Frank came through the door. She smiled in greeting, but her smile quickly disappeared when she saw the pained expression on his face. After they were seated and had placed their orders, she could stand the suspense no longer. For heaven's sake, Frank, what's happened? You told me to let you know if I had any more information about my wife, he said. Well, I don't know if this is relevant to your investigation, but I just found out that Meredith was cheating on me. As he said that, he was ashamed to feel tears flood his eyes and run down his cheeks. Celia reached across the table and grabbed his hands. Oh, Frank, that's horrible. Tell me what happened. The whole story of the meeting with Bobby's teacher, the confrontation with his son, and Bobby's anguished revelation came spilling out, interrupted only by the arrival of their food. Celia listened quietly, letting him tell the story at his own pace. Only when he'd reached the end did she speak. Per Bobby, she said, it's no surprise he's been acting out in school. This must have been eating away at him ever since it happened. And then with her death, it's no wonder he's been so conflicted. She'd released Frank's hands when the waitress had brought their order, but now she leaned across the table to reach for him again. 
I can hardly imagine what this had done to you, Frank, she said quietly, and Frank could see the sympathy in her eyes. Was there any indication that something was wrong, Frank? Now that you look back, did you see any clues? She asked. No, he said. I can't say I saw anything. You know what they say, the husband is always the last to know. He looked down at his untouched plate for a second, then back up at the woman. Ever since she got her big promotion, our sex life had fallen off pretty sharply. But between the pressures of her new role and her travel schedule, I figured it was understandable. I didn't like it, but I felt like I had to accept it for our family's sake. She kept telling me things would get better once she moved up to the national level, but, he paused, I guess that wasn't to be. Then he scowled. What's killing me is I don't have any answers. I don't know who the bastard she was sleeping with was. I don't know when their affair started or how long it had been going on. I don't know if she was in love with the guy or if she was planning to leave me. Worst of all, I don't know why she would do that to me and the kids. Celia squeezed his hands. Frank, please listen to me. The truth is that you're not likely to ever get the answers to your questions. You're going to have to let all that go. With her death, none of that matters anymore. All you can do is focus on taking care of your family and yourself. I know you're right, he said, but it just hurts so bad to be betrayed that way. It makes me wonder when she stopped loving me. No, Celia said fiercely, you're wrong. Whatever else may have happened, it's clear that Meredith still cared deeply about you and the kids. Look what you found out at IMC. She bought the maximum life insurance to make sure you all were protected. She maxed out her contributions to the 401k plan to put money away for your future. I don't know what else happened in her life, but those sure look like caring acts to me. Thanks, Celia. I'll try to remember that. As they stood to leave, he looked down at the table. Neither one of them had touched their food. I guess I'm not a very good lunch date, he said wryly. Don't worry about that, she replied lightly. Missing a meal or two is probably a good thing for me. Frank looked down at her slim shape. It sure looks good to me, he thought. Then he was startled to realize he was thinking about her in a sexual way. It's been a long time, he told himself ruefully. As they walked out the door, she took his arm. Please stay in touch, Frank, and let me know if there's anything I can do. I'd really like to help. Then she reached up and gave him a kiss on the cheek. As she turned away, Frank thought he saw a hint of a blush on her cheeks. Driving back home, Frank was surprised to find that his mood had lightened. I guess I really needed to get that off my chest, he told himself. The next Saturday, Frank had been out in the yard picking up limbs that had fallen during a storm. When he got inside, he saw Lori talking on the telephone. He turned to Bobby, who was standing nearby. Did someone call? Frank asked. No, Bobby said dismissively, she's just talking to her new BFF Celia. Frank was surprised. Does she call Celia often? And what's a BFF? Oh, Dad, Bobby replied in exasperation, you're so out of it. BFF is best friend forever. Just then, Lori looked up and saw her father. Daddy, can we ask Celia over for dinner? Let me talk to her, he said, extending his hand toward his daughter. When she handed him the phone, he said, Hi, Celia, I guess you heard that. Would you like to have dinner with Lori tonight? Bobby and I will be here too. He heard her melodic laugh followed by a quick acceptance. Great, he said, why don't you get here about six o'clock? After they concluded arrangements, Frank hung up and turned to his daughter. Well, she's coming, he said. I hope you're happy. Oh, yes, daddy, she squealed. Well, in that case, you and Bobby need to start doing some straightening up around here, so she doesn't think we live like pigs. Oh, dad, do I have to? Bobby complained, but before Frank could reply, the boy turned and started to pick up the clothes he'd left in the den. He's still a teenager, Frank thought, but he seems to be doing better. As he turned ahead for the kitchen, Frank began to consider what dish he could make. Definitely something better than spaghetti and meatballs, he thought, remembering the first time Celia had eaten with them. He finally decided on a fish dish he considered one of his specialties. He felt confident in his ability to make it, and the kids liked it well enough, which was always a plus. To do that, he knew he'd have to make a trip to the grocery store. Explaining his errand to Bobby and Lori, he enjoined them to stay in the house till he got back. He found a nice piece of salmon in the seafood department, and then decided to pick up some dessert from the bakery. I ought to pick up a nice bottle of wine while I'm at it, he thought, and turned his cart down the appropriate aisle. After finding what he wanted, he made a detour to the store's floral department and picked up a bouquet for the table. On his way home, he began to think about what he was doing. I'm really going all out on this meal, he realized in surprise. He finally decided it was because he owed Celia a good meal. 
After all, I did ruin her lunch, he told himself. Celia rang the doorbell promptly at six o'clock, and before Frank could get to the door, Lori was already showing her in. To Frank's amazement, even Bobby deigned to present himself, and the teenage boy actually made a little polite conversation. For his part, Frank found himself feeling a bit awkward and inarticulate, but if she noticed, Celia made no sign. Instead, she chatted happily with Lori and willingly went with her to see something the girl wanted to show Celia in her room. By the time the two of them reappeared, dinner was almost ready. The meal proved a great success. Celia was suitably impressed by his cooking skills. Ew, a man who can cook? Mother warned me about men like you. She teased and was also clearly at ease with his kids, both of whom chattered away to her in response to her questions. When dessert was finished, she insisted on joining in the cleanup, and with her help the dishes were soon cleared, rinsed, and put in the dishwasher to be run later. At that point, Bobby wandered off to resume a video game he had paused, and Lori wanted to watch a favorite program she had TiVo'd, so the two adults refilled their wine glasses and wandered out to the living room. Frank, everything was wonderful, Celia complimented him. I don't know when I've had such a good time. Thank you so much for asking me. I think Lori would never have spoken to me again if I hadn't, Frank laughed, and Celia joined him. She's a wonderful young lady, and you're lucky to have her, she responded. And her dad does pretty well, too. Frank felt his face flush. But then Celia's face took on a more serious look. Frank, in addition to having a lovely time with you, I'm glad you invited me because there's some information I want to share with you. Frank caught the new tone in her voice and looked at her curiously. This is highly confidential, Frank, but I feel I know you well enough to trust you. And it concerns you, at least indirectly. Now she definitely had his attention. As you know, Celia began, the GBI had to make a routine investigation before a death certificate could be issued for your wife. And, as you also know, we found nothing to give us any reason not to proceed with the declaration, which was duly issued. She took a deep breath and continued. Naturally, we did the same thing on John Collier, but there we found a few oddities. For one thing, it appears he was in financial trouble after a series of bad investment decisions. Frank nodded. What Celia said mirrored what Amanda Collier had told him. Moreover, in the last few weeks, Celia went on, the security department at IMC let us know that they have uncovered what appear to be significant irregularities in the Southeastern Region Accounting Department, the function that John Collier had it. Even more disturbing, they believe they've uncovered a fraudulent invoicing scheme that may have embezzled millions of dollars from IMC, and John Collier appears to have authorized it. Poor Amanda, Frank commented, she didn't deserve this. But then he began to process what Celia had told him, and new possibilities began to arise. Could John Collier have had a hand in the crash? He asked. Could it have been a way to cover his tracks? When Celia said nothing, Frank's imagination went into high gear. What if Meredith found out about Collier's scheme? What if he murdered her to silence her and used the plane crash to hide the evidence? Could he still be alive? Maybe he's tucked away in some villa by the sea, laughing at all of us. Slow down, Frank, Celia urged. You're getting carried away. The most likely scenario is still that the plane went down unexpectedly, just like we've thought all along. If Collier was indeed involved in an embezzling scheme, the crash cut short his plans. We'll investigate all the possibilities, but we can't jump to conclusions, and neither should you. But it was hard for Frank to turn off his imagination. You don't think Meredith could have been in on it, do you? He asked abruptly. Celia sighed. It's not impossible, she conceded, but we don't think it's likely. In the first place, if she were involved, that would mean she was planning in advance to abandon her family. It's unusual for a mother to abandon her children, especially kids their age, she said, gesturing toward the kids' rooms. Collier, in contrast, had no children, and his wife has indicated that their marriage was on the rocks at the time of his disappearance. Moreover, unlike Collier, Meredith's finances were in good shape, and she did nothing prior to her disappearance that would suggest she was in on any scheme assuming there was one. In fact, if anything, her actions were just the opposite of someone planning to disappear. But all that is just speculation. The one fact we do have, Celia went on, is that Meredith's plane did go down at sea. She had hoped to calm Frank, but as she looked at the man, she could see that he was still upset by her revelations. Frank, you've got to promise me that you won't say anything about all this. It's highly confidential, and if word got out, it could jeopardize our investigation. It could also get me fired. That brought Frank up short. He realized that Celia had taken a risk in confiding in him, and he owed her an obligation to keep quiet. I understand, Celia, 
and I promise I won't compromise your investigation. But I have to ask, why did you tell me all this? She looked at him seriously. It's highly unlikely, Frank, but there's always the possibility that you might hear something or find out something that could help us shed light on all this. If you do, Frank, promise me you'll contact me right away. No, Lone Ranger, acts, please. He returned her look. I promise, Celia. Then he smiled. Besides, having to contact you again wouldn't be such a chore. The smile she gave him seemed to brighten the room. Shortly after that, Celia had to leave. Before doing so, she made a point of saying goodbye to both Bobby and Lori. Frank noted that Bobby actually paused his game to say goodnight, a real compliment coming from him. Once again, Lori walked her friend to the door, extracting a promise from Celia to call her. But this time, after Lori had hugged her, Celia made a point of leaning back inside the door and bestowing a kiss on Frank's cheek. As she walked to her car, Lori looked up at her father and said, She likes you, Daddy. Frank smiled at his daughter and clasped her to him. Well, I like her too. After everyone had turned in for the night and the house had grown quiet, Frank lay in his bed, chewing over what Celia had told him and all the various scenarios he had imagined. Oh, Mary, he thought. What did you get yourself into? Finally, he fell into a restless sleep. It was a week later while Frank was on his computer when he noticed something unusual. He had been reading about some of his favorite sports teams, and as he got ready to click on his Falcons bookmark, he noticed the Facebook icon just above it. On a whim, he clicked it. Frank was not a Facebook follower. In truth, he rarely ever visited the site. The only reason he had set up an account was to allow him to keep an eye on his children. Both Bobby and Lori loved the social networking site and used it as another way to stay in touch with their friends. Frank had initially had no objection, but after reading a couple of scary articles about some of the pitfalls, he set up his own account and insisted that Bobby and Lori friend him. He also had them give him their passwords to their pages as well. That way, he reasoned, I'll be able to see any messages or pictures they post, as well as anything their friends send to them. Even more important, he figured Bobby and Lori would know he could monitor them, and that, he hoped, would encourage them to be prudent. As he logged on to his own page, most of what he saw held little interest for him. But he did notice a friend request from someone he had never heard of, Tom Thomason. The name didn't sound familiar, and there was no picture, only a silhouette. When Frank clicked on the name, the stranger's page blandly informed him that personal information was available only to friends. Hey, Bobby, he yelled. Do we know a Tom Thomason? His son walked into the room and saw that his father was looking at Facebook. Oh, that guy. Just ignore him, Dad. He's been bugging me to friend him for weeks now. I just delete his requests. Lori popped into the room just then. Yeah, he's been trying to get me to friend him too. He's just some Facebook creep. That was enough to catch Frank's attention. Some unknown person not only wanted to make contact with him, but also with his children. There were all kinds of scam artists out there, Frank knew and a few far worse predators as well. He was alarmed, but he didn't want to frighten his children, so all he said was, you two did exactly the right thing, he assured them. Don't ever respond to anyone you don't know well over the internet. Grasping for ways to protect his family, he had a sudden idea. I wonder if Celia could help us find out who this Thomason creep is. He called her at home, and she must have seen his name on caller ID because she answered warmly, Hi, Frank. Hi, Celia. I'm glad I caught you. Is there any chance you could come over? Something odd has come up, and I'd like to check it out with you, if you're free. It's nothing serious, is it? Bobby and Lori are okay, aren't they? As he reassured her, Frank couldn't help but observe that she seemed as concerned about his children as he was. It gave him a warm feeling. She told him she'd been working in the yard, but could be over in 45 minutes. To Frank's surprise, almost exactly to the minute her car pulled up to the curb. With Mary, he remembered, you were lucky if she wasn't more than an hour late trying to make her image perfect. But here was Celia, right on time, obviously freshly showered and clad in a casual but attractive outfit, with her hair nicely combed and wearing fresh makeup. It was clear that she'd made a special effort, even in such a short time. You look nice, Celia. You didn't have to get all dressed up for us, he told her. She squeezed his hand. Thank you, Frank. I wanted to. Once she was in the house, Frank called his kids. When they came noisily into the den, he asked them to tell Celia about their would-be Facebook friend. As the official expert in the family, Bobby seized the opportunity to show off by rapidly logging onto each of the three of the family's Facebook accounts in turn and retrieving the friend request from the mysterious Tom Thomason. 
After complimenting Bobby on his skill, Celia seated herself in front of the screen and called up all the unread and archived messages, but she wasn't able to uncover any additional information. Finally, she looked up at Bobby and Lori. The most likely answer is that this is some kind of marketing ploy. If you had accepted the request, you'd probably be receiving all kinds of ads for junk you don't want or offers for imaginary gold from Nigeria. There are some bad people out there, and you should never give any information about yourself to strangers. Okay. The two kids nodded solemnly, and Frank thought to himself that hearing that message from Celia probably had more impact on them than when he had given it. It had grown dark outside while they'd been working at the computer, and Frank knew that his kids would soon be hungry. Celia, we're probably going to go out to get some dinner in a little while. It won't be anything fancy, just a family-style restaurant, but we'd love to have you join us if you can. Immediately, as Frank had known they would, Lori and even Bobby began to clamor for her to come with them. She laughingly surrendered to the inevitable. The four of them piled into Frank's sedan and headed off to a casual place not far from their home. As they drove, Celia began asking the two kids about some of what she'd seen posted on their Facebook pages, and soon Lori and Bobby were eagerly talking about their friends and activities. As he listened to the conversation, Frank marveled. Celia probably already knows more about what's going on in Lori's and Bobby's lives than Mary ever did. He recalled that on the rare occasions before her death when they'd all gone out together, Meredith's conversations revolved mainly around her job. He felt guilty for his disloyalty, but he knew it was true. The lively conversation continued through dinner and the trip back home, and Frank was pleased when Celia came in the house with them. The kids promptly plopped themselves in front of the TV and asked Celia to come watch with them, but she begged off. I need to talk with your dad a while. She took his hand and led him into the living room. After they were seated, her face grew serious and she said, I didn't want to alarm Bobby and Lori, but I don't really think those Facebook requests were a marketing ploy. The Bureau has gotten warnings about some identity theft scams, but those normally don't target children. This looks to me like someone is making a concerted effort to get information about your family. The thought of a threat to his children sent a chill through Frank. Who could it be? What could they want? I don't know, Frank, she replied. This doesn't seem to fit any pattern of cyber scam I've seen before. What can we do? Should I close their Facebook accounts? Should I keep them off the net altogether? She looked thoughtful. I don't think that's necessary, as long as they're careful and don't have any interactions with strangers. And if they get nonsense emails with embedded websites, warn them never to click on the links. She thought some more and then spoke up. The trouble with the internet is that it's so amorphous. You can't tell who you're dealing with or where they are. But it's not quite as opaque as most people think. I've got a friend with the federal government who might be able to help us. He probably can't find out who Tom Thomason is, but he might be able to tell us where he lives. Let me make a phone call on Monday, and I'll let you know what I find out. With that, she arose and went into the den to say goodnight to the two kids. When she returned, Frank walked her to the door, but before he opened it, he hugged her. You've been like a guardian angel to us, he said earnestly. I don't know what we would have done without you. She looked him in the eye for a moment, then gave him a quick kiss on the lips. I don't know whether I want to be an angel, she said with a wink. They don't have all that much fun. Then she turned and walked rapidly to her car, leaving Frank standing there bemused. True to her word, Celia called Frank late on Monday morning. Do you know anyone in Palm Beach, Florida? She asked. Not a soul, Frank replied. Well, Whoever Tom Thomason is, he set up his Facebook account from a zip code that starts with 334, so he's somewhere in Palm Beach County, she said. I can't imagine why anyone in Palm Beach would be trying to connect with us, Frank said, but at least he's not anywhere nearby. That's reassuring. I agree, Celia said. Furthermore, we've traced a lot of scams to South Florida, so maybe this really is only some new kind of internet scheme. Just be sure Bobby and Lori don't have anything to do with those friend requests. I will, Celia, and thanks. I feel a lot better about all this. I'm so glad I could help, Frank. Despite what he had said to Celia, Frank was not reassured at all. On the contrary, he felt as though he and his children were under a continuous assault. First had come the terrible news of Meredith's death, followed by poor Bobby's revelation that his wife had cheated on him. Then he had been told that Mary might have been involved in some crooked business dealings before her death. And now some unknown person was trying to get information on his children. Frank felt like they were under siege, and he decided he was going to fight back. His first priority was to find the enemy in Palm Beach County and confront him. But how could he do that? 
A quick check online showed the county had a total population of 1.3 million. Searching for Tom Thomason would be like looking for a short stick in high grass. Besides, Frank thought, the name was just as likely to be a phony. Frank's orderly mind continued to wrestle with the problem. Then an idea hit him. If I can't find Thomason, maybe I can get him to find me. A plan began to take shape in his head. It's a long shot, he admitted, but it's all I've got. The first thing he had to do was to get Bobby and Lori safely out of the way. It was almost time for summer vacation, and that gave Frank an idea. He dialed the number of his in-laws. Dad, would you and Mom be interested in having Bobby and Lori come visit for a week? I've got to make a trip out of town during that time, so it would really help me if you could. When the children's grandfather had gladly agreed and the logistics of their stay were arranged, Frank hung up and immediately called Delta. I'd like to book a flight to Palm Beach. His kids were excited to hear about the upcoming visit to their grandparents, but their enthusiasm was dampened when they learned their dad wasn't coming with them. This would be the first time they'd been separated since their mother's death, and the prospect brought back some of the fear of abandonment they'd been dealing with ever since that painful time. Frank hated to cause his children any kind of distress, but he felt he had to do what he had planned, so he managed to persuade them. The week before their visit was to begin, Frank found himself beset with doubts. Am I doing the right thing? He kept asking himself. But despite his uncertainty, the thought of doing nothing was even worse. His inner turmoil was interrupted briefly by a phone call from Celia, calling to inquire how he and his family were doing. After a chatting a few minutes, her tone of voice changed slightly, and Frank thought she sounded almost shy. I was wondering if you'd like to get together next week. It's been a while since I've seen you and the kids end. Her voice tailed off uncertainly. I'd love to do that, Celia, but I'm taking the kids to see their grandparents then. We'll be gone all week. Oh, she said, I understand. Maybe some other time. I'd really like that, Celia, he said fervently. Frank had hated to lie to Celia about his plans, but he told himself, at least it was partly true. Besides, he was sure he knew what she would say if he had revealed his true plans. When Frank returned home after dropping his children off at his in-law's home in the country, he immediately sat down at the family computer. One of the reasons he'd asked Meredith's family to take his kids was that he knew they didn't have a computer. Accordingly, he felt safe in logging onto Lori's Facebook account. Sure enough, there was a friend request from Tom Thomason. Frank clicked on the accept option and quickly received a confirmation that Lori was now friends with the stranger. If nothing comes of this, Frank thought, I'll just unfriend him later. Next came the most difficult part, pretending to be a 12-year-old girl. He had studied his daughter's previous postings and he thought he could do an acceptable job of emulating her style. I probably won't fool her friends, he admitted to himself, but hopefully I can fool Tom Thomason. He decided his first post should set the stage, so he wrote a brief note mentioning his, Lori's, visit to the country. Just a little update for her friends, Frank thought, nothing to make a lurker suspicious. The next day was when he planned to set the trap. OMG, I'm going to Florida. My BFF Celia offered to take me with her, and Daddy said yes. Leaving tomorrow, can't wait. Frank decided to use Celia's name because he felt neither Lori's friends nor Tom Thomason would know her. He hoped Celia wouldn't mind. Now that the bait was in the water, Frank hoped to wiggle it enough to attract the fish's attention. I can't believe I'm in Palm Beach. It's to die for. That evening, Frank posted the next installment. Spent the day at the beach. I'm gonna be so tan. The next morning, Frank posted the note that he hoped would set the hook. Heading back to the beach today. Tomorrow, Celia is taking me shopping on Worth Avenue. We're gonna have lunch at Tabu. Too cold. As soon as the entry appeared on Lori's page, Frank headed for Hartsfield Jackson International Airport. Soon he was settled in for the tower flight to Palm Beach. As he gazed out the window, he recalled that he had been to Palm Beach once before. In fact, he and Mary had driven through the city on their way back from their honeymoon in Miami Beach. They'd taken the bridge across Lake Worth and then driven along South Ocean Boulevard, gawking at the mansions overlooking the Atlantic. Upon landing, Frank picked up a rental car and drove to the motel in West Palm Beach where he'd made reservations. There was a fast food restaurant across the street, and he picked up a sandwich and a cola that he ate in his room while studying a map of the city on his laptop. He hoped he was doing the right thing. Following breakfast, he checked Lori's Facebook page, but all he found were a few envious replies from classmates of hers. He hadn't really expected any contact from Thomason, but he had hoped for some kind of indication that his fishing expedition might land something. About 10 o'clock, he got in his car and drove east across the Royal Park Bridge, 
turned south and then east again onto Worth Avenue. He wanted to be in position early, and he needed to park his car on the street so he could get to it quickly if need be. After circling the block where the restaurant was located numerous times, he began to wonder if he'd miscalculated. But suddenly a car pulled out just ahead of him, and he was able to pull into the vacated parking spot. After feeding the meter, he walked along the street in front of the restaurant. Spotting a bench in the shade, he gratefully took a seat. He brought along a baseball cap and sunglasses, and he put those on in hopes of disguising himself. Then he pulled out a copy of the Palm Beach Post and pretended to read while scanning the street. As he sat there, the realization of how flimsy his plan was slowly began to sink in. He had no idea if the mysterious Tom Thomason had even seen the phony postings on Lori's Facebook page, nor if he would show up in response. Even worse, Frank had no idea for whom he was looking. Unless the mystery man turned out to be John Collier, which Frank had to admit was pretty unlikely, how would he identify the threat? All he could hope was to spot someone acting suspiciously, whatever that meant, and confront him. The street was crowded, and Frank kept busy trying to watch all the passers-by. The restaurant began to fill up, and as he watched people entering, his stomach began to growl. He cursed himself for not thinking to bring along a sandwich, but he dared not leave his post. Time slowly crept by as he sat there, and after a while he saw that the restaurant crowd was beginning to thin out. A glance at his watch told him it was after one o'clock. What an idiot, he thought. I wouldn't have been any worse off if I'd stayed home, and at least I could have seen Celia again. As he watched the window shoppers stroll by, his eye was caught by a woman strolling on the other side of the street. I'm doing it again, Frank thought, seeing Mary in a crowd of strangers. In fact, he noted, the woman really didn't look like Meredith at all. Meredith had shoulder-length brunette hair. This woman was a blonde with her hair cut short. Likewise, her clothes were a different style than anything Frank had ever seen Meredith wear. But there was something about her that looked eerily familiar, and as Frank continued to watch, he realized it was the way she walked that had triggered his reaction. Impulsively, he stood up and started to walk after her. Looking down the street, he saw the blonde had reached the corner and was trying to flag down a taxi. Risking his life, Frank ran across Worth Avenue and jumped in his car. Just as he was pulling away from the curb, he saw the woman clamber into the back of a cab and start off down the avenue toward the Atlantic. Before it came to South Ocean Boulevard, the cab turned left on County Road and began driving north. Frank followed at a distance. Finally, he saw the cab turn left on a suburban street and continue until it almost reached Lake Worth. Frank pulled his car to the side of the road about a football field's length away and watched as the woman paid the driver and then went into an elegant home that appeared to front on the lake. Frank squinted his eyes in an effort to see her clearly. With her hair color and short hairdo, she looked nothing like Mary. But she was the same height and weight, and as she proceeded up the walkway to the house, Frank was again struck by her walk. As he sat there in the car, Frank suddenly remembered a book he had read long ago. In the story, an actor found it necessary to disguise himself. But rather than use a false mustache or wig, he simply put pebbles in his shoes. If someone sees me, the actor told a friend, they'll say that looks kind of like the guy, but it's not him, because I'll be walking differently. It works the other way too, Frank thought. As he remembered the book, he grew more and more certain that he had just seen his late wife. Trying to control his rising anger, he ran down the street and up to the door. He rang the doorbell and then crossed his arms to wait. When the woman opened the door, she looked at him with a puzzled glance. Then she did a double take and shrieked, Frank, what are you doing here? Hello, Mary. Funny running into you here, he said sarcastically. After a moment's hesitation, she threw her arms wide to embrace him, but he quickly held his hands up to stop her. Don't touch me, he snarled. Then he could no longer constrain his anger and he yelled, how could you do this to me? How could you abandon Bobby and Lori? Glancing anxiously toward the street behind him, Meredith grabbed his arm and pulled him into the house, pushing the door closed behind him. I did it all for you, baby, for you and the kids, she said urgently. You've got to believe me, it was the only way. As she spoke, she kept glancing around nervously. What in the hell are you talking about? Frank demanded hotly. You're not making sense. None of this makes any sense. Sit down, baby, she urged him. You've got to let me explain. She was still speaking loudly and was nervously rubbing her hands together as she took a seat and encouraged him to do so. An icy calm came over Frank as he sat down. All right, Mary, I'm listening. I was so close, baby, I had the big job I wanted in my pocket. But then the damned economy began to tank. 
I knew if I could just keep the region's numbers up a little while longer, the economy would come back and the promotion would be in the bag. She gave him a pleading smile and held her hands palm out toward her husband. And Frank, once I got that job, we'd have been on easy street. No worries about paying for college for the kids, no worries about retirement, no worries ever again. Frank could barely contain himself. This was all about money and Mary's position in the company. Meredith's hands fell back in her lap. So John and I. John Collier, Frank said darkly. Yes, she went on, not reading his mood. You met him. Anyway, he and I figured out a way to pull some sales forward from our biggest accounts. We knew they'd come through eventually. We just booked them early, in the current quarter. All the other regions were reporting big sales declines, and we were pulling in major increases. Corporate was just blown away. We earned the biggest bonuses the company has ever paid she said proudly. Then the smile slipped from her face like a tissue dropping to the floor. But the economy got worse instead of better, and when John told me it was all going to come out eventually, I knew we had to do something. We knew we'd need a lot of cash to pull it off, so John set up a dummy supplier account and began sending fake invoices to IMC. They're so sloppy and wasteful at that place they never even noticed. So you plan to fake your deaths in a plane crash to cover your tracks? Frank asked. That's right. Baby, she said, as though Frank was her star pupil. With enough money, it's not hard to get somebody to leave a Zodiac motorboat with a GPS signal out in the Caribbean. We just honed in on the signal and crash landed right beside it. So the whole thing was just a way to steal a bunch of money and abandon your family? John asked bitterly. No, baby, she protested. That's not it at all. I knew I'd have to get out of sight for a while, but I made sure you and the kids would be okay. I loaded up on life insurance and put everything I could into my 401k, so you guys would have plenty of money, she said proudly. And you thought having enough money would make up for losing my wife and our kid's mother? This time she heard his bitterness. No, baby. No. You don't understand. I was going to come back for you. Once everything had had a chance to blow over, I was going to contact you. We could go someplace safe. Baby, we could be together. As she spoke, her eyes continued to dart around the room. Frank looked at her with a stony gaze. There's just one thing you've left out, he said in a flat voice. What's that? Baby, she asked. You forgot the part about you screwing John Collier, he said. She was startled at first, but then she stood and lifted her arms to him. No, baby, it wasn't like that. John and I just worked together. We were never more than colleagues at work. Don't lie to me, Meredith, Frank snapped. Bobby saw you two together in our bedroom. She gasped. Oh my God, Bobby saw us? Oh, that's terrible. A sob caught in her throat, but then she recovered and straightened up again. It was just the one time, baby. He told me he wouldn't help me unless I gave myself to him. But it was just the one time, I swear it. Frank stood up. Ignoring her, he looked around. Come on out, John, he said loudly. I know you're back there somewhere. Meredith continued to wail. No, baby, it's just me. It was just the one time. But before she could continue, John Collier emerged from the bedroom. He was wearing a bathrobe and his hands were stuffed in his pockets. Give it up, Mary, he knows, Collier snarled. Even though he guessed that the two of them had been living together, hearing Collier use his wife's pet name caused Frank to bristle. Meredith began to weep. He must have found us through Facebook, Collier hissed at her. I warned you, but you just had to check up on your two brats. Then his tone changed to something cold and hard. But it doesn't matter now. We've got to get out of here. He turned to Frank and from the pocket of his robe pulled a snub-nosed automatic, which he brandished in Frank's direction. As for you, bright boy, you're the only one who knows we're still alive. No, John, no. Meredith screamed, but Collier ignored her. It looks like your kids are going to lose their daddy as well as their mommy, he said with a sneer as he raised the gun at Frank. I wouldn't do that if I were you, came a voice from the entry hall. All three of them jerked around a look in amazement as the figure of Celia Murray emerged, holding her Smith and Wesson automatic leveled at Collier. Before Collier could react, a second voice spoke up from behind him. Drop the gun. Collier. It's all over. Special Agent Harold Barnes stepped out of the kitchen, his pistol also trained on Collier. The former accounting executive glared at the two agents with hostility, but then his shoulders slumped and he dropped the gun to the carpet and slowly raised his hands. While Barnes kept his weapon trained on Collier, Celia swiftly stepped behind the sullen man and twisted one of his arms behind his back, cuffing him at the wrist. Then she swung his other arm down and clicked the second cuff shut. Once Collier was secure, she repeated the process with Meredith. When the two were lying on the floor, 
Barnes got on his cell phone to the Palm Beach Police Department. A second call went to the local FBI office. In a short while, the house was swarming with uniformed and plainclothes officers. Frank just stood to one side, looking on in a daze. As the two fugitives were being led away, Frank peered carefully at them both. Collier was muttering to himself. Meredith was weeping. Neither glanced in Frank's direction. When they were gone, Celia went over to Barnes and gave him a hug and a kiss on the cheek. Thanks for coming with me, partner. I owe you big time. The older agent smiled. Nah, you don't owe me anything. Solving this case is going to look real good on both our records. As Barnes left, Celia finally looked at Frank. To his amazement, she walked over to him, threw her arms around his neck, and began to sob. You big idiot. Don't you ever do that to me again. You could have gotten yourself killed. He held her tightly until her crying subsided. Then he tilted her back away from him enough to look at her face. What are you doing here? He asked. How did you know where to find me? She smiled through her tears. Lori called me to chat. When she told me that you weren't with them at their grandparents' house, I got suspicious you were going to do something stupid and started checking around. When I saw her posts on Facebook, I called the airlines and found out you had booked a flight to Palm Beach. I talked Harold into coming with me, and we've been following you ever since this morning. She shook her head. We almost lost you when you took off after that taxi, but Harold guessed which way you'd turned, and he was right. Frank held her even tighter. I guess you really are my guardian angel, he said, and kissed her. Two years later, Frank pulled the collar of his coat tighter around his neck. The humidity was high as always, and the wind off Puget Sound was cold and damp. Still, Frank thought, it feels good to be here. The past two years had been hard in many ways. While it had been a terrible shock to Frank to find his wife alive, the impact on Bobby and Lori was even worse. Having to see her brought to trial and convicted on multiple criminal charges only added to the family's pain. During the inevitable media frenzy surrounding the arrest and trial, Frank feared his kids wouldn't make it through it. The divorce was a mere formality. Meredith might no longer be legally dead, but she would be spending the next 12 years of her life in Arendelle State Prison. International Marketing Corporation, of course, demanded that Frank return not only Meredith's life insurance but also the bulk of her 401k, since it had been funded based on bonuses she had not earned. As an innocent party, Frank might have had a case for keeping some of the funds, but he wanted nothing to do with any portion of the money from his ex-wife. Instead, he began an urgent search for a job, since his family's savings were all but exhausted. The offer he got from a major aerospace company was a welcome one, not only because it would ensure the means to provide for his family, but also because it meant a relocation across the country. There were too many reminders of Meredith in Atlanta and too many questions from friends and others that he and his children couldn't answer. Finding a new place to live and work seemed like the best solution for all of them. Frank hated to leave the state where he and his children were born, but he was ready to embrace the Pacific Northwest and start a new life. They'd gotten lucky on the sale of their Atlanta home and were able to buy a nice, if somewhat smaller house in Seattle. Meredith had always wanted to live in a showplace. Frank was happy with something cozier. The kids seemed to like it too, and they were already making friends at their new school. He came in off the deck and looked around for his car keys. Finding them, he stuck his head in the kitchen to look for his wife. Come on, Angel, let's go pick up our kids. Celia smiled happily at him. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comment section below and don't forget to like, share and subscribe.